Okay, so I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I don't have a good memory. A lot of people think I do, because I often give classes off the top of my head with just a marker and a board, and because I tend to do very well in memory dense exams like the USMLE and memory dense subjects like microbiology and all that stuff, right? But truth be told, I was never really one of those guys that reads a chapter once and memorizes everything without breaking a sweat. No, I'm more like the guy who goes downstairs, opens the fridge and forgets why he came down in the first place. Hmm? So because of this situation, one of the questions I often get asked is how were you able to memorize everything you memorized in medical school, right? If it wasn't a matter of natural memory, then what was the secret? Flashcards, memory palaces, fancy retrieval cues, the special Red Sox of Destiny? Shout out to everyone who understood that reference. Well, no, the answer is none of that. I mean, don't get me wrong, those tactics are awesome, but they were a relatively recent addition to my study protocol. For most of my life as a student, I didn't have none of that. All I used to learn were a bunch of old school learning techniques, and that was that. Some of those techniques were good, some were not that good, and some were really, really useful in helping me do something that some of the most modern techniques, like flashcards and memory palaces, often neglect, which is that it helped me to transform seemingly arbitrary and random details into coherent, intuitive and almost logical concepts. They didn't improve my memory, they made me less dependent on it. And that was kind of my secret. These sort of skills, as I just said, are often neglected with all the fancy techniques we now use and love. And that's precisely why I wanted to make this video, to teach you guys what were my top three learning techniques to not only memorize, but to truly comprehend and master what you study. I'm also going to show you an amazing tool that I've recently found to implement these tactics and a few examples to show you how to apply all this stuff in real life. Quick warning though, these techniques are not quick fixes. They don't give you instant improvements overnight. No, they're more like a long-term type of investment. They require an upfront payment in terms of time and effort, and they provide very little instant results. But if you keep doing them, if you keep investing and keep putting your effort, then you will start to see how learning as a whole starts to get easier and easier. So without further ado, let's get to it. Oh, and I almost forgot, this video was sponsored by Screentool. More about them in a minute. Okay, so there's a concept called reasoning from first principles. You've probably heard of this. Elon Musk talks a lot about this. But first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. So that's first principles, a reasoning approach to solve problems. But you know what? First principles can also be a learning technique if you learn how to use it correctly, if you get in the habit of asking the right questions in the right times. Now, I want to clarify something here because a lot of people get this wrong. First principles learning is not just opening a chapter on, let's say, high blood pressure and reading away what the normal blood pressure is, why is it important, what are the factors that influence it. No. That is just a standard learning and everyone does that. The meaningful exercise, the exercise that really makes a difference happens in all those situations when people usually don't zoom out to ask the questions. For instance, one time I was giving a class on diabetes and I asked my students, do you know what is a typical serious adverse effect associated to the use of metformin? Everyone said lactic acidosis. Everyone knew that, everyone knew that particular concept. But then I asked why? Why does metformin actually cause lactic acidosis? And nobody answered. Nobody knew. Nobody had taken the time to zoom out and learn the first principles behind this little detail. If they had done it, they would have realized that this seemingly arbitrary and random detail wasn't actually arbitrary and random at all. It was very logical and very intuitive and it links both the mechanism of action of the of drug and the metabolism of glucose, and it makes total sense. But that didn't happen. And that didn't happen because we as students tend to study only the stuff that is portrayed clearly and obviously in the chapter that's in front of us. And that's what I truly mean with first principles learning, going beyond the mere explanations of the books and really asking yourself whenever you encounter a seemingly arbitrary and random detail, why does this happen the way it happens. So for instance, why do ecchymoses look the way they look? Why do ultrasounds look the way they look and produce the images they produce? Why do intergreen mutations lead to immunodeficiencies? These are the sort of questions you need to start asking yourself. These are the sort of questions that will start to transform all of these arbitrary and random things into very intuitive concepts. Now you can totally do this in your head. 
for sure. But if you're one of those people who love to annotate everything you learn, you will find that studying like this is a pain in the ass. Because you see, the very same mindset of first principles thinking makes you deviate from the topic you're trying to learn. And so even if you leave spaces to annotate later, or you switch notebooks, or you switch folders, you will find that all the solutions to truly learn first principles are either ineffective or inefficient. So if you want my recommendation on how you can make this process a lot more expedient, I would suggest you try out the application I told you about a minute ago, the screen tool. This is a newish sort of note taking application and I really, really like it because it offers a lot of flexibility and speed when it comes to switching between ideas and perspectives. So for instance, let's say you're taking notes about physical injuries and you go to the part about ecchymosis and hematomas and then your first principle mindset kicked in and made you wonder, hmm, why do hematomas look the way they look? So instead of having to pull out a completely different notebook or open a completely different folder, all you need to do in ScreenTool is type the plus sign and open a new card to annotate the first principles of the topic. In that new card, you can annotate freely everything you want about porphyrins, which is the reason why ecchymoses look the way they look, without disrupting the main focus of the note you were originally creating. You can open the new card and leave it blank in case you want to search the first principles, but later, or you can totally delve deep into the rabbit hole and end up learning about porphyrins and heme and bilirubin and why does our urine look yellow and all that kind of stuff. But the point is that you can do all of these rapidly and while also staying organized. Two of the things that are very hard to do using the typical usual note taking systems. And yes, in case you were wondering, the new notes are reusable, meaning that if one day you're studying another topic, let's say, Gilbert syndrome, and you also want to link that note to the card on porphyrins, you can do so by again just typing a plus sign and selecting the card you've already created. The end result is that your notes end up looking like a hyper index library, like the ones you typically find in platforms like Ambos, where one thing leads to another, and that to another, and to another, and so on and so forth. And I don't know, I just think that's quite awesome. Okay, so back in 2018, I was still a medical student, right? And but at the time, I was going through my pediatric rotation. So one day when I was in the ER, a patient with chronic granulomatous disease arrived and I was the student in charge of taking that history. After doing this, I presented it to my attending and then I received the typical comment of, read about this disease and we'll discuss it tomorrow morning. If you're a medical student, you know that this happens a lot and that it can be really stressful as one afternoon is often not enough time to properly learn everything you want out of a complex topic like chronic granulomatous disease, right? So I totally understand why many medical students go home and focus 100% on learning just the details they need on just the topic they need. However, I for myself used a completely different approach when I was learning. I tried to learn as much as I could from the general context that surrounded the topic as I possibly could. For instance, in the case of chronic granulomatous disease, what I did was take about an hour or two of my afternoon to learn about the general classification and the general features of the main primary immunodeficiencies. Now, why did I do that? Why did I waste an hour of my precious time learning about a bunch of arguably unrelated topics that I'm probably not going to get asked tomorrow morning. Well, because sometimes learning the big picture and the big patterns is precisely what one needs to properly learn and properly remember the little details and the little facts. There's a famous chess experiment that proves this and Veritasium has an amazing clip explaining it. So I'm going to play it to you. In 1973, William Chase and Herbert Simon recruited three chess players, a master, an A player, who's an advanced amateur, and a beginner. A chessboard was set up with around 25 pieces positioned as they might be during a game, and each player was allowed to look at the board for five seconds. Then they were asked to replicate the setup from memory on a second board in front of them. The players could take as many five-second peaks as they needed to get their board to match. From just the first look, the master could recall the positions of 16 pieces, the A player could recall eight, and the beginner only four. But then the researchers arranged the board with pieces in random positions that would never arise in a real game. And now, the chess master performed no better than the beginner. After the first look, all players, regardless of rank, could remember the location of only three pieces. The data are clear. Chess experts don't have better memory in general, but they have better memory specifically for chess positions that could occur in a real game. The implication is what makes chess masters special is that they have seen lots and lots of chess games. And over that time, their brains have learned patterns. So rather than seeing individual pieces at individual positions, 
they see a smaller number of recognizable configurations. So that is sort of what I try to do with my study. Instead of focusing on the individual pieces, the individual syndromes, I focused on learning the big patterns, the big categories of immunodeficiencies. Doing this not only helped me to ground each individual syndrome and remember it better, but it also helped me in training my mind how to approach an immunodeficiency case. Doctors use this sort of pattern recognition approach a lot. You see a feature, you decide which category it resembles the most, and then you start to think about the individual syndromes that could be at play here. Now, to apply this technique, all you really need is to ask the question, to ask the question of what's the context here, right? Why, how does the big picture of this subject look like? And you can certainly do this in your head, for sure. But again, if you want a tool that can help you be a lot more explicit in your approach, I suggest using a screen tool. You see, in a screen tool, you're able to do a couple of things. First, you're able to take the usual notes you usually take, and where you can dump information and images and videos and links, just like in your typical note. But then you're also able to minimize that note and use it as a moving piece in a huge whiteboard. This feature, coupled with the ability to connect notes with one another, allows you to create some of the most flexible and versatile big picture structures I've ever seen. So for instance, here I have a board that has some of my notes on the primary immunodeficiency syndromes. And what I did was basically organize the canvas into different sections with different maps. And each map represents like a different pattern of an immunodeficiency syndrome. So for instance, here I have my map on the T-cell disorders, and here is my map on the B cell disorders, and here is my map on the mixed disorders, and so on and so forth. Now, if I go ahead and zoom into the, for example, the T cell disorder map, I can appreciate that there's a central node with all of the general features of this pattern, right? So I can appreciate like the general features, maybe the all of the diseases, and peripherally to that node, I can appreciate all of the other individual syndromes that are branching off. I can open any individual note I want and I can read or I can type information. I can also make it full screen and annotate better or I can also minimize it and just get a glimpse of the note. I can close it. I can show a preview or not show a preview. I can do a lot of stuff, right? As a matter of fact, I can even do stuff like this. I can start hiding away some of these links and I can start reorganizing the big picture as you can see here, not as into maps, but into like tables, into multiple tables or single tables and make my columns. I can also search for nodes that I've previously created, like for example, the one on porphyrins, I can just search here for porphyrins and I can drag and drop into the canvas if I want to have it be part of my big picture structure for some reason or another. So yeah, the app has a lot of features that help you explicitly train that big picture mindset that we're discussing here. Uh, also, in case you were wondering, Squintel offers you the possibility of creating different spaces or boards to organize your notes and organize your information. For instance, here is my board on the primary immunodeficiency syndromes. But if I wanted, for instance, to create a board on, let's say, immunology as a whole, I could do so as well by selecting all the notes and creating a new board with those notes. In that way, the, the notes, the cards, the maps on the immunodeficiencies appear both in the primary immunodeficiencies board and also in the immunology board as a whole. All right, and the last learning technique I want to discuss here is something I like to call connecting outside the box. And in simple terms, it's basically figuring out ways to apply the last couple of techniques to subjects where people don't usually think it's possible to apply the last couple of techniques. So take something like geography, for example. Geography is actually a really good example because it's one of those subjects that people usually believe that is entirely up to memory. Because, I mean, how do you remember that Belgium is located in this part of the map, that this is Belgium? Like, do you ask why Belgium is located here? Do you search for the first principles of why is it located here? Do you search for the general classification and do you, do you try to contextualize the classification of European countries? That's not very helpful, right? So in these cases, what I try to do is search for the first principles or the context by thinking or by trying to connect outside of the box. This, as far as I can tell, is not really a teachable skill. It's not something you learn by watching a video. It's something you learn through practice, through doing. But I'm just going to give you an example of how I would be able, again, to just memorize why Belgium is located here uh, to show you what I mean. So I don't know if you know this, but in World War I and also World War II, Germany invaded France. Well, it actually invaded a lot more countries, but one of those was France. But the way it invaded France was not the typical way you and I would imagine if we looked at a map. Why? Because if you look at a map, you will realize that Germany and France are very, very close together. 
But the interesting thing is that Germany almost never attacks directly through their border. What they do is that they first sneak into Belgium and then they attack through the border with Belgium. That was a favorite move by the Germans back then. And for me, it's kind of interesting, right? It's, one, it's kind of like one of those things about strategy and about war that almost seems like part of a movie. So this sort of story is fairly easy for me to remember. And what I realized a couple of years ago was that whenever I listened to a story like this and I looked at the map, I went ahead and looked at the map, the, the location of the countries stopped being a random isolated detail and it started being like a very almost intuitive concept to remember. Now when I look at an European map, locating Belgium is not hard at all because I remember the story and the story traces me back to the location. Now again, that was just one example, but it goes to show you that sometimes there are non-intuitive ways to learn context or principles that directly help you to learn seemingly arbitrary details and facts. Now again, you can do all of these sort of tactics and these sort of techniques by just using your head or just using your basic note-taking system and that's fine. But as I've tried to demonstrate throughout the video, applications such as Crintel do help and can help a lot if you want to be a lot more explicit and expedient with your learning process. Now, how can you use a screen tool in case you're interested? Well, you have a couple of options. First, you have what they call an early access plan. There you pay five bucks per month and you receive all the current features available in the platform. And that option is really great if you're truly interested in the app because those who sign to the early access plan lock that price point, that $5 per month price point and join an exclusive community that has a saying in how the app is developed and where it goes. So if you want some special feature to be added or something to be changed about the platform, this is where you wanna be. So that's one option, but another option for for those who are not exactly sure if they want to use the app, app or not, that it seems promising, but they first want to try it, you have an option to join the waitlist. By joining the waitlist, you basically get a one month free trial where you can use and test all of the premium features of Scrintel to see if they are what you're looking for or not. By joining the waitlist, you can also become part of the referral program. And if you become part of this program, you can pretty much earn cash for everyone who signs up to Scrintel using your link. So that's another cool option to have in mind. But anyways, I hope the video was useful. Thanks for watching. Uh, check out Screentel using my link if you're interested. And I'll see you in the next one.